dedicated to creating, implementing, and verifying detailed manufacturing standards exemplifying CGMPs in practice, AMSA. It was co-founded and formation facilitated by consumer volunteers, Link Williams and Lou Ritter. They continue to lead this groundbreaking effort as unpaid volunteers, and the association is making notable progress. And Lou's going to speak first, I think, and then Link. Is that right? Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to give a big thank you out to uh, Farrell, Daryl, and the entire staff and organization of TMA. I think they've done a wonderful job putting together this, this event for the last few days. Um, and thank you all for being here, and especially those of you that stuck it out to the end here. <laughs> here we have to say, this is, this is a little humbling. I mean, there's so many highly credentialed and accomplished professionals here, and I'm just a consumer volunteer. <laughs> so I don't know if, if any of you remember the, the book from childhood, The Little Train That Could. Sometimes I hear in the back of my head, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. So all right, let's talk a little bit about AIMSA. Uh, so we, we uh, the, the, first, the first thing in, in, in getting to AIMSA was, was finding members that would agree to self-regulate and agree to standards. Um, and I have to say that I am incredibly honored by our membership because these folks have come together, they have gotten behind something that is the first in the industry, uh, first in the world, and they've done a phenomenal job, they're living up to it, and uh, we really look forward to seeing where the association is gonna go from here. So we have 12 general manufacturing members, they represent 15 labs. Um, they all pay the exact same dues, and they all have an equal say in the association. One member, one vote. We have two subject matter experts, we have two consumer advocates, that's Link Williams and myself as the co-founders. And it's an interesting point to, to mention that um, we have zero payroll. Our, our consumer advocates and our subject matters are all volunteers and they do this out of dedication to the goal and to the mission and the focus of what we're doing. We believe in what we're doing. Uh, we have uh, AIMS advocates GMPs. In fact, our standards really are the delineation of good manufacturing practices. And uh, we launched on October 8th, 2012. And AIMSA is a non-profit non professional trade association and we have attained 501c6 status. So our main focus really is reasonable, realistic, and sustainable regulations. Um, obviously it's self-regulation at this point. We think what we've put together is a good model or example for what could work on a governmental level. Um, <clears throat> It's a certainly a good starting place. So in today's presentation, I'm kind of glad I did not try to talk about what self-regulation is because we've had much better <laughs> presentations of that already. So I'm gonna talk for a few minutes about why and how we built AIMSA. Then Link Williams will pop up here and he's gonna talk about where we are today, what we're advocating and some directions for the industry. So why did we really build AIMSA? We saw lots of things that caused us some concerns. Um, aside from the fact that there was all these manufacturers out there making product and selling product, but we didn't really, no one, no one knew what really how it was being made. And so we saw that there's unprecedented industry growth. We saw um, some of these estimates, keep in mind, they're, they're based on, you have to look at the assumptions for how these estimates were derived. So there's, there, there's some pliability maybe in some of these, but the, the current global estimates uh, exceed, exceed 5 million product consumers. Current estimates indicate 2 billion global market with the USA having the largest share. Um, we've seen some estimates say that the market could be one to $2 billion by the end of this year. And um, we've certainly seen some estimate that ENDS products could outgrow tobacco products in 10 years. So we also saw that it, we didn't see any, any real sources that were disseminating accurate product information. Um, we didn't see any industry example or model. Uh, for responsible manufacturing, and there's certainly no shortage of economic uh, opportunists. And in fact, we see sometimes we see demand so high that we see new vendors almost weekly. Uh, we saw a need to promote and demonstrate responsible product stewardship. 
Um, of course, we also see, as we said, in a, a domestic and global lack of accurate product knowledge. That's something that's existing around the world. We see an extensive amount of misinformation, disinformation prominently circulating. Um, we saw a need to educate the public, regulatory consumers, and all any all that are misinformed. But one of the areas that was particularly of concern to us was to raise awareness in the regulatory arenas. Um, state and municipal, municipalities attempting to regulate without accurate product knowledge. All you have to do is really go pull some of these transcripts and see that regulators are admitting right on the record that they do not know, and yet they're trying to proceed with regulation in spite of their own ignorance. They're just admitting it. So we, we really feel that there's a need to, for them to recognize that they don't know what they don't know. So, and one of our goals is, is to inform and kind of tell the world. Um, and it's really kind of truly amazing some of the stuff that we're seeing out there. Some of this is completely unprecedented. Um, we're seeing global online internet communities uh, with hundreds of thousands of active participants through various forums, both international forums and individual country domestic forums. Um, we're seeing online chat shows and chat rooms, social media, books and more. And all of this stuff is, is this community that's come together where people are creating support structures and sharing information and product information. I, I've really never seen anything like it. And it, it's how I got involved in this. It's how I end up standing here today. It's how I met Link Williams. It's ultimately how AIMSA was created was because of this network of communication. We see many other advocacy uh, groups, CASA, uh, Svata, Tveka, each may be very effective in its own individual foci. One of the things we saw was we didn't see anybody posting or putting up specific details. And so that was something that became important to us to be very transparent and, and talk about details. And we certainly hope to see more around the world going in this direction. And we'd love to see more standards organizations in this industry around the world. And we'd love to create a network, a global network of, of, of such efforts. Um, and the other thing that we saw is, is that there's, the, in spite of, of what we know here today from this event, um, we've seen prevalently discussed that there's like no medical research, no scientific research, and we just have an absolute array of it. Many of them have spoken here today, and over the last course of the last couple of days, of course, Dr. Konstantinos Forcelinos, uh, Dr. Michael Siegel, Dr. Brad Redu, Dr. Nitzkin, Dr. Pelosa, um, and of, of course, seeing the former Surgeon General, uh, Richard Kimona, joining the board of Enjoy recently, certainly has some kind of weight to it and certainly sends some kind of message. Um, Bill Godshall, I mean, the man's got a library. I mean, he's un an untirable <laughs> public advocate. I mean, he, he go look at his blog and his information. It's, it's more than you can possibly read. Clearstream Project is, do, is studying uh, va secondhand vapor and tissue samples, all kinds of things. And there are others. Even TMA is starting to put together a searchable database on tobacco harm reduction um, and, and regulatory issues. So um, on the Weems website, on our links page, we've got some research citations, and we're in the process of updating those with some new ones. So now this is, a, is an interesting aspect that a lot of people don't know about is the refillable aspect of, of the electronic cigarette industry. And we believe that this actually is a huge contribution to the efficacy of these products. And what you're gonna see here is just a small sampling of some of the specific atomizers, cartomizers, tanks that are designed exclusively for refillable liquids. And this is something that is not yet prevalent in the world information, but in the community sharing, what we call the enthusiasts, and within the community, we're, we're all quite familiar with them. Um, but each one is unique, and each one has a different character to the vapor. And the, all the different refillable liquids that are available, so the combination between these individual heating elements and all these different liquids, creates very unique characteristics to vapor. You can put the same liquid in each of these different, and this again is only a small sample, would give you a very different vapor. And if you're not familiar with this, you wouldn't really understand it, and there's no way to communicate it other than maybe through a wild analogy. If you were, for example, to go to the supermarket and buy a bunch of ingredients to make yourself a nice dinner from scratch, and you came home and you put them together, you could cook them in a microwave oven. You could cook them in a cast iron pan. You could cook them in the oven, under the broiler, on the barbecue. Each would give you a radically different dinner. Well, that's what you're looking at. That's what all these, and there's so many more. I mean, we can't begin to, to, to display them all, but 
the, this combination allows people who are consumers to find the combination that gives a character of vapor satisfying enough to allow them to stay away from smoke. Um, and let there be no mistake, as, as pre-fill cartomizers as they stand today are represented by the microwave cooking <laughs> in this example. Um, sorry, but it's just the reality. <laughs> So, so how did we get started? Um, Link and I met, again, as we said, through the community. And every time we got together for, I don't know, over six months, we always had the same conversation. Someone should, someone should, someone should. And about a year ago, this coming June, we were at an event in Florida, and we were having lunch, and we had the same conversation. Someone should. This is so necessary, so needed. And that afternoon, I was off in a different direction, and Link went and pulled together a couple of e-liquid manufacturers that he knew well enough to invite to dinner. And so we all went out to dinner and we talked about this idea of some kind of self-regulation and we were surprised at how responsive they were. And so over the course of the dinner, we came out of that dinner with the five belief statements from which all of AMSA grew. So let's take a look at those. We have a responsibility to verify the accuracy of the nicotine content in the products we distribute, uh, to ensure the quality of all ingredients, to prepare products in a clean, sanitary, and safe environment, to ensure the products are packaged and delivered in a safe manner, and to provide a level of transparency into the monitoring and verification process. It's pretty self-explanatory, but of the details, of course, are all on our website. Um, let's see where we just... So as we went further down the process, the next thing we had to do was kind of figure out, okay, the nicotine quality and accuracy of content. So we realized we needed to get some experts, subject matter experts. So the first place we reached was into the community. We had a very well-credentialed, PhD organic chemist who was already a vapor, was in the community, had already been active in the community, Dr. Kirk Kistler. He jumped onto this in a heartbeat. He was very excited about it. A couple months later, we got introduced to Enthalpy Analytical. Dr. Gene Gilman is here today. He spoke earlier in, in the conference. Um, they've got over 20 years' experience focused on tobacco and nicotine analysis. And they, we developed a relationship with them to start analyzing our members' products at the various stages, some of the different ingredients, to verify accuracy and quality issues. As we developed that relationship, Enthalpy decided they really kind of supported what we were doing. They liked our idea of product stewardship. And they agreed to join us as our second volunteer subject matter expert, one of the group leaders and very highly credentialed. Uh, a PhD organic chemist, Dr. Matt Melvin, is now um, a, full, a member of AIMSA as a subject matter expert, again, as a volunteer. So then we went on to the ingredients and the environments and the packaging, and we figured, all right, let's just go to the source. So we went right to the FDA standards for commercial food manufacturing, and we took them out one by one, and we just converted everything that we could possibly apply into our industry vernacular and applied those. And then, of course, our members agreed to scheduled and unscheduled inspections. Um, so then we go on to transparency, and uh, our standards are posted right up for the world to see. You're all welcome to them. Just go to our website, click on standards. It's a downloadable PDF. Uh, we've already come out with our, some amendments to our first version. We're getting ready to work on some refinements. Um, Enthalpy Analytical is helping us work on the new revisions to our, our standards right now for nicotine. Um, so we're going to come out with our 2013 version. Um, our, our, we maintain a list of the status of all of our members right on the website, so at any time anybody can just go look and see exactly where the members are relative to being in compliance with our standards. Uh, on the why AIMSA and the mission page are written in very simple, plain English, and yet the content in the message is targeted to multiple audiences to be as informative and educational about what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it. Uh, we have a protege mentor program that is this is free of charge, and this is an opportunity for other e-liquid manufacturers who want to interact with us, want to raise their standards, want to work in the direction of coming up to this level of standards. There is no charge. They pay no dues. They get coaching from our members and from the board of directors directly, and they don't pay any dues until they become a full-time AMSA member themselves. Um, we hope that our material and our, our example that we're setting is encouraging the industry. We have it posted right on our website. Even if you don't want to join our association, we encourage you to raise your standards, publish your standards, use our material. And of course, we hope to provide a source of accurate information to use for any and all, especially consumers. When I first got into this, in, into vaping, I saw this plethora of websites and all these pretty pictures of all these different liquids and these different juices, but I had no idea how they were made. 
what questions to ask. I didn't have a clue. So we're hoping that our information, our standards, gives consumers the opportunity, the place to go and see how these products are made, what goes in them, and it gives them a foundation of material and, and a basis for questions to go ask to their vendors and to educate themselves more about the products. Um, so new technology really surprises us all. I mean, sometimes it seems that we have to adjust to technology almost daily. Look at the way we use our telephones, our computers, our tablets. Um, no one could have foreseen this technological approach to harm reduction, least of all the long established regulatory procedures. Um, but new technology demands new thinking, new perspectives, new approaches. Let's face it, the world's watching. A lot of the world follows the United States. Don't we owe it to our society and to all of humanity to really lead the way and facilitate this in every harm reduction alternative? With that, I'm going to turn this over to Link Williams. He's going to talk to you about where we are and where we're headed. Thank you, sir. So let's see what the first slide that comes up is. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we advocate for. You may have heard us say it uh, a couple times. We're about reasonable, realistic, and responsible. Uh, and obtainable and sustainable regulations. So when we're talking about reasonable, we're really, as consumers, we're looking for fair and sensible. Um, we're looking for those based on uh, common sense and that represent the core principles of good product stewardship um, and maintain the balance of product stewardship and the customer protection. When we look at realistic, we're asking about science-based. We want it based on facts as opposed to the fears and uh, the, the rhetoric that comes about it. Also very important to us is it must be obtainable by small and mid-sized businesses. To put into place regulations uh, that are not obtainable by the market and the, the businesses that actually built this industry of the e-cigarettes and e-liquids, to me, I think would be a crime and a shame. Um, and it has to be based on the awareness of the things we know today, and we recognize that it's an evolving thing. It's based on the science we have today, and if that science changes tomorrow, it needs to be adapted to this current science that we have. And then based on the principle of trust but verify, which is a, a principle I, I strongly believe in that we trust businesses to do it, but we also put in a verification system to be able to do that. And then finally, uh, sustainable. And sustainable, really, the core of that to me is there has to be a pathway from a beginning business to being able to get and fully comply with that regulation as opposed to an instant switch type of situation. Okay. So what we hope to see in this industry, so we, at bare minimum, would like to see the industry establish minimum material grades when it comes to e-liquid manufacturing. It's a fact when you work with uh, a, an emerging market, we have the cowboys out there who will take shortcuts in order to, to establish their business. We'd like to see those minimum grade standards and they're economically not really an impact to, to a good manufacturing process. We'd like to see a published standard. We publish our standards, and we're not necessarily saying that people should use the standards that we use, but we think it should be a requirement that every organization publish what they manufacture to and what those manufacturing uh, standards look like. We believe that a good manufacturing practice should be adopted widespread. A lot of these are common sense if we go back to ours. Okay. We believe that they, we'd like to see the uh, industry as a whole invest and promote not just in the e-liquid and e-cigarette industry, but actually invest in the entire tobacco harm uh, reduction movement, uh, because I believe that all of it facilitates um, itself. And then finally, we'd like to see the industry support uh, the funding of science and research. Um, because the e-cigarette market, and especially the market that we deal with, is a very small uh, industry. We're talking uh, typical uh, sizes, two to seven million dollars a year, uh, of which a good portion of that goes towards operating cost. Um, we'd like to see as the industry grows that their participation in science become greater and greater. So just to, uh, to quickly go through, because I know we're over our time, um, just to kind of give you an idea of what we've accomplished in the last nine months, 
We established the standard, we published it, we obtained our 501c6, we've grown from five initial members, we're now 12, and we actually represent 18 labs uh, now across the country. We've testified before the FDA multiple uh, times. Uh, we've uh, established uh, uh, affordable product testing for our members, and this was one of the biggest uh, things, especially when you're dealing with entrepreneurs, they had no idea what laboratory test and science was about. We were able to bring all of them together and now get them on a standard regime to be able to test their products and know with a high degree of certainty the quality uh, that they're producing. We've had a, a listening session with the FDA where we got to sit with 30 FDA representatives one on one, or one on 30, um, uh, and discuss the standards uh, and uh, collect feedback from them. Uh, on the standards, and I can't read the slide from here. Oh, uh, we've actually uh, started our inspection process uh, and certifying members. So if you go to our website today, oh. <laughs> uh, if you go to our website today, uh, you can see that there are multiple uh, member of ours who have actually uh, obtained their certification. They've gone through uh, the process of verifying all of their material, their processes, as well as past physical inspections uh, where the inspectors have come on site. Um, and, uh, that, and I just hit that step. Wow, that was quick. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're very proud of what we've done. We know it's just the beginning. We're only nine months old, but we're moving forward at a, at a at a pace that we think is, uh, is appropriate, especially for the time frame of the regulatory environment uh, that we're in. And uh, we welcome any and all questions.